What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Peter Zihan. Peter is a geopolitical strategist and author who writes and comments extensively on how macro forces like demography, geography, economics, energy, agriculture, and politics all interact together to generate the outcomes that form the contours of international relations and political history, what we broadly think of as geopolitics. I wanted to get Peter back on the podcast for his perspective on the very serious situation that is not just unfolding, but possibly unraveling in Eastern Europe at the moment. Not surprisingly, this was a very in-depth conversation covering not only the European theater and US-Russia relations, but also the risks of military confrontation with NATO, nuclear escalation, and risks to energy markets and global food systems. We also speculate on China's involvement in the diplomatic effort over Ukraine, the implications for Taiwan, the dollar system, and so much more. My objective in bringing you this conversation today is to situate the war in Ukraine within this larger geopolitical framework. So that when you see things like Saudi Arabia engaging in talks with China to price some of its oil sales in renminbi, or Egyptian bonds selling off over concerns about wheat shortages and rising prices, you are able to put it all in context. Premium subscribers will have access to the second part of today's conversation with Peter, along with the transcript and intelligence report, which are the cliff notes to the Hidden Forces podcast, formatted for easy reading of episode highlights with answers to key questions, quotes from reference material, and links to all relevant information, books, articles, etc., used by me to prepare for this conversation. And with that, I bring you this week's episode with geopolitical strategist and author, Peter Zihan. So Peter, welcome first and foremost to Hidden Forces. This is your second time on the podcast. Always good to be back. It's great having you. And uh, so you're going to be out with your new book soon in a few months. And I was telling you that I did manage to read it. It's phenomenal. And this is not why actually I brought you on the podcast. I had intended, of course, to have you on to talk about your new book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. But the situation in Ukraine with Russia and this whole larger geopolitical crisis has really kind of, I feel like, forced me to, to do a number of episodes, and this is one of them, to try and understand what's going on, because so many people have so many questions. I guess to start off, can you help me and my listeners understand where and how you think this invasion fits into the broader multipolar order that is being born currently and that you've been writing about for years? And I should say we are recording this today on March 17th. Well, let me start by saying I wouldn't call it a multipolar order because that would mean that there's some sort of agreement on the rules. The United States is backing away from globalization and just letting the pieces fall. And it's up to countries to scramble for whatever they can. But in the case of Russia specifically, when the Soviet Union existed, the Soviet Empire was you know, one of the largest empires we've ever had on Earth, and they were able to occupy certain territories that have always been critical to the Russians' view of themselves. If you look at a map of population or of farmland in Russia, they're going to perfectly overlap. You're talking about an area that starts at the Ukrainian border and stretches east into Siberia, and it's surrounded by a lot of open, flat territory. And so the Russians have tended to get invaded over 50 times in their history through those open, flat territories. So the Russian goal, going back to Catherine the Great, has always been the same. Expand beyond those flats until you can control the gateways that give access to the Russian space. Places like the Tamir Gap in Central Asia, or the Altai Gap going to China, or the Baltic Sea coast. And when the Soviet Union existed, they controlled all nine of the gateways. When it was reduced to rump Russia, they went from nine to one. And everything that Putin has done since has been about getting Russian boots into those gaps to secure it for the future. So we had the uprising in Kazakhstan. Russian troops went. That plugged the gap. We had the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict last summer. Russian troops went in as part of the peacekeeping group. They plugged a gap. The Russians invaded Crimea in 2014. They went in. They took it. They plugged a gap. 
and two of the remaining gaps are on the other side of Ukraine, specifically the Polish and Bessarabian gaps that in the past the Germans or the Turks have used to invade. So from the Russian point of view, this was always going to happen. The only question was timing. And when it became apparent that uh, the tide had turned in the United States, Putin felt he needed to act very quickly. If you remember back to the impeachment hearings for Donald Trump, the very, very short version is that Trump admitted publicly to blackmailing the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, in order to get some dirt on the Biden family. And when that didn't work he suspended military transfers to Ukraine. Now, under Biden, those military transfers had started up again, and in November of last year is when the Javelin anti-tank missiles started making it to the front. And the Russians realized that the balance's forces were shifting against them, and so they realized they needed to go now. And that's where we are. So we're definitely going to talk about the larger geopolitical dimensions, but I want to stay with this immediate conflict for a bit longer. How sure. do you think that this invasion has gone relative to how you would have expected it to go? <laughs> well, if in 2014 the Russians had moved and just taken Ukraine in whole, I think they would have had a, an easier time of it than they have. They took Crimea without firing a shot. But they also went into the Donbass and the Luhansk and Donetsk provinces backed what they say are separatist groups, even though they're Russian staffed and have Russian intelligence and Russian weapons and Russian special forces and Russian logistics. Whatever. Propaganda. By keeping that conflict hot for eight years, they did the single best thing they could have done to consolidate the Ukrainian national identity. Most people in Ukraine before that didn't even think of themselves as Ukrainian, especially in the eastern half of the country. Now they do. And we've seen, I mean, I, I don't want to overplay this because we're only in the third week of the war. But the degree of just absolute incompetence in planning and strategy and logistics that we have seen on the Russian side is mind-boggling. It is worse than what the Iraqis were doing during the first Desert Storm conflict. So if they had done this back in 2014, 2015, they probably would have been in Kiev in a couple of weeks, and they probably would have conquered the entire country in less than three months. Now we're probably, probably looking at double the amount of time. And then they'll be facing a raging firestorm of a guerrilla war in order to occupy a country of 45 million people. This is shaping how the United States views the conflict. Because when this first happened, we just assumed that they would steamroller the Ukrainian forces. They're outnumbered, they're outgunned, their logistical capacity is awful. They have very few pieces of heavy equipment that you could stand up to a, a major Russian assault. But that convoy really changed minds in Washington, both in DOD and the White House, because we saw this 40-mile convoy that should have been able to just devastate Kiev, and it stalled out in a day because it ran out of fuel, and then its troops abandoned it two days later because they ran out of food. You know, that's Keystone Cops invasion stuff. And so we now know that if an American force comes up against a Russian force, the Russian force is going to be obliterated. And while that might make us feel good in terms of a conventional war, for the Russians, this is an issue of absolute national security for them. And if American forces of any type become involved in that kind of conflict, the Russians will have two choices, a humiliating strategic withdrawal that they may never recover from, or escalate to nukes. So the plan in NATO, the plan in Washington now, is to feed as many weapon systems as we can into the Ukrainian space. Anything that does not require a fixed point support, so no planes, no fixed air defense assets, but lots of missiles, lots of vehicles, and keep the Russians locked down on Ukraine as long as possible. Because if they can't finish Ukraine to their satisfaction, there's no point in them then rolling further west to get to their real goals. So this has become the Russian killing field. That's the plan now, to make sure that this is the last war that Russia can ever fight anywhere. All right, so many things to explore there. I'm going to throw out a few questions. Number one, do you think also that if in 2014 the Russians had actually tried to take all of Ukraine, that the larger geopolitical environment and alliance framework would have been more amenable to that? In other words, that the Obama administration 
would have been more reticent to push back, just as it were in the case of Syria. That's one thing. Hold that there. And then I just want to push back a little bit and on the point about what this tells us about Russian forces. Isn't it also true that many of the logistical challenges that they've had are a result of the fact that they had miscalculated how quickly they could take Ukraine, the strength of the resistance. And also, there are some suggestions that I think actually make a lot of sense, which is that Putin held this invasion close to the vest because he became increasingly paranoid, in part because of the really good job that the Biden administration did running interference on the information war, something, again, back to the point about the Obama administration, that the Obama administration would not have been able to do because we were just simply not up to speed by that time. Well, let's deal with Obama first. Uh, Obama was famous for not allowing anyone into the White House that disagreed with him. And if they did agree with him, they had 90 seconds to make their point and then he wanted them out. He hated conversing with people. So as a commander in chief, he and Donald Trump in many ways were two sides of the same coin. Obama didn't want to talk to anyone about anything. And Trump would talk to anyone, just not about whatever the topic of the moment was supposed to be. It's not that I think that Biden's a great president. It's not even that I think he's the best president we've had in 13 years. I think it's he's, he's the only president we've had in 13 years. And so, no, Obama would have not led a coalition in the way that Biden did because he would have never even discussed the intelligence with his staff. And then, of course, Trump was so self-absorbed that the idea of uh, getting involved in another country's military conflict, no matter what the pros or the cons would happen to be, would have just gone out the window. So yes, under the previous two presidents, the Russians could have just rolled. Considering what Biden said during his campaign and how his foreign policy was for the first year, I think Putin very clearly thought that this was just the third in a row. And I think that's the biggest surprise that Putin has had, is that the United States actually has stood up for the first time in over a decade. So whether that's a miscalculation or not, you know, we can have that debate. But this has a bit of a Cuban Missile Crisis feel to it in that the Russians were sure that the Americans would back down or or just not show up. And so far, that's been a miscalculation. For the military strategy piece, I'm going to have to go with the hard no. I mean, I was thinking the same thing in the first couple of years. Excuse me. The first couple of weeks. Sure feels like it, doesn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> What's that saying? For decades, nothing happens. Then in some weeks, decades Vladimir happen. Lenin. Yeah. Oh, my God. Smart dude. <laughs> so that is definitely what I thought in the first couple of weeks. That, you know, there's just there's a piece missing here. The Russians will plug it in. They're still going to walk over this. But as days go on, it hasn't happened. And only giving your troops two days of food to occupy a city of three million? No, that's not enough. For a convoy 40 miles long to not have fuel trucks? I'm sorry, that's horrible planning. There was an attack this morning, sorry, it's uh, March 17, on the airfield at Kyrgyzstan, which is the one city that the Russians have captured. It came down the road from Mirapol, which is a road that supposedly the Russians control. And it involved air assets. And there's no excuse for why the Russians have not a secured air superiority just yet. They've got their anti-aircraft missile batteries ringing Ukraine, giving them like 95% coverage. You know, drones are still operating. They should all be shot down. The Ukrainians are still running 25 to 30 sorties a day. They shouldn't have an air force at all. We've seen pictures of airfields that the Ukrainians have been operating at that have been hit by over 60 munitions, but only one of them hit the runway. I mean, we're seeing this complete incapacity to use what we think of as fourth and fifth generation warfare that we thought in the United States that the Russians were not a peer power, but an ear peer power. And we're seeing none of that. But on top of that, we're seeing things that Lessons they should have learned in World War II, and we know they learned in Grozny. You know, if you've got a tightly packed convoy, that means all the other guy has to do is hit the first vehicle and hit the last vehicle, and then they just dice up everything in between. That's happened dozens of times. The Russians have lost all the hard lessons that they've paid for with blood in previous conflicts, and it's just stupefying. Now, I do have a theory, and it folds into some of the other things that are going on right here with the why now. The Russian birth rate has been declining for decades. And when you have things like famines or world war, you have a lot of people who are killed. The birth rate in those years is significantly lower. And the Russians have had these things stack on 
on top of each other because there was World War I, then there was World War II, then there was collectivization, then there was Brezhnev. And at each stage, the kind of the melon scoop out of the demographic structure got bigger, with the biggest one of all being the post-Soviet collapse in the 1990s. Well, the people who were born in the post-Soviet collapse are now about to be all of um, the draftable population. The Russian demography is now in terminal decline. It is the second worst demography on the planet, second only to China. There's a topic we can kick into later. And so the Russians are literally running out of soldiers. If they didn't do this attack now, if they waited five years, it would be too late. They wouldn't have the army to try. And that has kind of melon scooped not just out their troops, but also their skilled labor and their leadership potential, and that includes their military leadership. So it could be nothing more than the Russian officer corps has become so small and so unskilled that this is all they can do. I have a hard time hanging my hat on that completely, but even if it's true, the Ukrainians are still going to lose this war. They're massively outnumbered, and the Russians have shown that they have a high tolerance for casualties, and the political situation in Russia is, has not turned against Putin. Sure, that we've seen protests, and of course, Western media has followed that with ghoulish detail, but we're talking about a country that has lost millions of people in wars in the past. We're nowhere close to that. And if you add up all of the protests that have happened throughout Russia through the entirety of the last three weeks, you're still talking less than one-tenth of one percent of the population. Most Russians are fully on board with this, either because they understand exactly what's at stake, the future of the Russian ethnicity's existence, or they buy into the propaganda. And right now, that is the only information they're seeing. Right. And that's actually uh, something that I do want to discuss with you later as well, which is what do we think we know and how do we know what we think we know about the opinion of the the Russian people, where and how it breaks down, and what influence that that will have on Putin's policy. Before we talk about that, and before we get deeper into the here and now, I do want to address something or get your view on something, which is that since this conflict broke out, actually before the conflict even broke out, there was a lot of infighting and apportioning of blame among various factions in American politics. That's a kind way to put it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was, I think, from the Western perspective, it, it either broke down in terms of institutions, you know, NATO, expansion, et cetera, or personalities, Putin. It's Putin is this demonic figure. Your work tends to focus much more on these glacial sort of forces, you know, geography, demographics, my first question for you is, to the extent that you believe that political decision-making is important, how and where do you apportion blame for where we find ourselves today? <laughs> well, my personal opinion is that the best modern president we've had is George Herbert Walker Bush, because he presided over the end of the Cold War without a shot being fired, and he set us on the path to getting rid of 80% of the nuclear weapons on the planet. Those are a couple huge wins from my point of view. And part of the reason it worked so well is he always told people, never dance on the wall. If you've got the Russian system that is self-disarming mm -hmm. and self-moving away from dictatorship, you do not brag about that publicly. You help them do it behind the scenes if you need to, in public if it makes sense. And because of that, he was able to push something that he called the New World Order, or the Thousand Points of Light, if you remember that. And the whole idea was to have a conversation among the American people about what kind of world we wanted to bequeath to the next generation. Now that the Soviet monster was gone, what do we want? And we decided we didn't want to have that conversation. We punished him for it. And in the next eight elections, well, the seven elections, we voted in the candidate who wanted to do less with the world. And when we got to this most recent one between Biden and Trump, we had two populists running who didn't even talk about American leadership at all. The only difference in terms of economic foreign economic policy between the two of them is that Trump ruled by tweet and then just let everything fall, whereas Biden is actually institutionalizing Trump-ish populism into American trade law and foreign policy, which makes it even more surprising that Biden has taken such a strong stance here on Ukraine. So, you know, the fault is ours. We're the ones who have elected a, a, a litany of leaders who are populist, who have not 
been interested in foreign affairs. And that's led to this point. If we had stuck with George Herbert Walker Bush 25 years ago, now it's been, we'd probably be in a very different place. We'd probably have a balanced budget. We probably would have been better prepared for the COVID epidemic. Uh, The Russians would probably not be a threat. China would be a radically, radically different place. Because remember, this is the guy who was in charge during Tiananmen, and he set things into motion to take us in a very different direction. And then Bill Clinton just wiped it all away. Uh, So, you know, if you're looking for a point, an inflection point, that's well in the past. Mm. The great hope from my point of view, because I'm I'm an Atlanticist, I'm a globalist, And I've kind of lost over and over and over and over again (laughs) in terms of American elections. But the hope is that this conflict in Ukraine will trigger Americans to finally have the conversation that Bush Sr. wanted us to have. And if we have a national debate about our place in the world and what we want to see, you know, maybe that will take us into a better place than we are now. But right now we're dealing with international disintegration. Because even if this war ends today, we're still looking at a multi-year energy crisis and a multi-year agricultural crisis that is going to generate famines that cover continents. And the energy crisis is going to trigger a global depression that will last years. I mean, that's just where we are now. The supply system has been disrupted on both points. And it will take us a minimum of five years to fix that. And these are all things that you've actually been writing about for a long time. If anything, the current crisis just accelerates them. Before we get into those things, I have a question. You mentioned that you called Biden a populist. That's an interesting way to think about him. Is he a populist? Is his administration populist? Because my memory of Biden was always the guy running for president that bored everyone to death with foreign policy. (laughs) You got a point. I'm talking more about his economic policy, especially when it comes to trade. Both him and Mm. Trump are broadly anti-trade. Every single thing that Trump did on his way out the door versus the Chinese and versus the Europeans is still there. There's actually only one thing that has changed. So, I mean, we still have all the sanctions on the Chinese. We still have all the domestic reindustrialization policies. We still have all the trade tariffs on everyone, with one exception. We did cut a deal with the Europeans. So that uh, any steel that comes into the United States and Europe, if it's made with uh, a lot of coal, will not get access. And that was specifically targeted against China. But honestly, I see that as just another tariff. But in everything else, he is putting the flesh on the bones that Trump started. Mm. It's disturbing to a certain degree, whether you're on the left or the right, the similarity between the two men when it comes to outcomes. All right. So let's bring it back to Ukraine now. I have a question, which is... Why is what happens to Ukraine important to the world? Because if the forces that we're dealing with here are so indomitable, specifically demographics and geography, why exactly does it matter? Well, let's start with the headline. The Russian government has been working to undermine the United States pretty much nonstop for the last 15 years. And uh, to a degree, they've been successful. They've been able to use things like social media and hacking, not just to interfere in our election system, but to back certain groups within the United States and especially to inflame tensions. So Michael Moore, Greenpeace, the anti-vaxxers, the MAGA crowd, he's gotten all of these groups to get a lot more coverage than they should have. And in, in cases of things like Black Lives Matters and Blue Lives Matters, they've tried to arrange for them to have rallies at exactly the same place at exactly the same time. And so they've taken whatever our social divisions are and basically taken a pry bar to them to try to split us apart. And a lot of the fault for why politics have just been so toxic in the last decade, you can put squarely at Putin's feet. And I have certainly noticed on my Twitter feed that I have gone from dealing with dozens of trolls a day to like five because the Russians no longer have access. So the elimination of RT, the state media firm, from global audiences has been wonderful for political discourse. And I don't mean to suggest that Russians are the only problem here, but you've got to admit in the last three weeks, a lot of the heat in the internal political debates has gone down because social media all of a sudden is not nearly as nasty as it used to be. So that's just kind of the one general current. Second, this is a country that has pointed thousands of nuclear weapons at us for 60 years. And so, you know, 
call me kooky. I would like that to stop. And if that means that Ukraine is the place where we have to make this fight happen, so be it. Because no matter what happens to Ukraine, there's nothing in Ukraine that is a core American national interest. This is the perfect place to bleed Russians without having any immediate impacts on anything else that we care about. Now, if Ukraine falls, which it will, and if the occupation is finally pacified, which it might, then we have to deal with this for real with NATO states. So drawing a line in Ukraine, I think, is the perfect place, because if it stops here, then it stops forever. And if it doesn't stop here, then we're talking about needing to defend places like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Romania. It's a very different picture from a risk point of view, and I would greatly prefer to not have a showdown with nuclear power in countries that we are treaty-bound to defend. Okay, now this is where we get to the really interesting slash scary part of the conversation, Peter, and also one that I think will shock a lot of people. And I think also, including me, even though I'd read This United Nations and I had you on the podcast and I had a very good understanding of your overall view, it wasn't intuitively obvious to me that you believed that Putin's plan was not to simply stop at Ukraine. At least that's how I've interpreted what you think his initial plan was. So let's take this from the top. What do you think that initial plan was? And how has it changed based on the resistance that he's gotten? And then we can begin to factor in what you think the proper responses by NATO and Western countries should be and why you think that they should focus on fighting the war in Ukraine and how that can be done without causing an escalation and provoking Putin to attack a NATO member. Sure. So Putin certainly thought that the war was going to be easier than it has been. All indications suggested that uh, within a month, they would have absolutely obliterated any meaningful conventional military capacity. And then it would be an issue of mopping up a country of 45 million people, which would take two or three months. That's clearly not happening. But the original, original, original goal was you secure Ukraine as quickly as possible. You set up your Quisling regime in Kiev. The thinking was there were plenty of Russian speakers. Nearly a third of the population speaks Russian fluently, mostly as their first language. And roughly a quarter of the population are actually ethnic Russians. So they thought they were going to be, to a degree, welcomed, at least in the East, and that they would not have to be going you know, building to building, leveling everything. Once they secured Ukraine, they would then grab Moldova, probably over a long weekend, because it's a country of two and a half million people. And they already have some troops there in a secessionist province called Transnistria that they kind of created in the same way they created the Donbass republics. Republics. Once that is done, then they go into the five NATO countries. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are one of those gateways on the Baltic coast. That's how the Swedes have invaded in the past. Eastern Poland going up to the Vistula River in downtown Warsaw to plug the Polish gap, which is how the, the Germans have always liked to invade, and then going to the southwest a little bit to grab territory adjacent to Moldova and Ukraine that is in Romania to plug the Bessarabian gap, which has always been the Turkish approach. That's always been the plan. That's always what the Russians have needed for security. But because the Ukrainians have provided more of a resistance and seem to have a stronger national identity than the Russians had counted on, they are now applying tactics that they used first in Grozny and then that they later perfected in Aleppo in the civil war in Syria. And it's simply urban obliteration to destroy every single piece of civilian infrastructure. Number one, to generate as many refugees as possible because refugees don't fight, they run. And the more Ukrainians that you can get out of the cities and out of Ukraine, the better. So we've had two and a half million Ukrainian refugees so far. It is the single largest refugee flow ever, and it's happened in less than three weeks. You should count that two and a half million going up at least to 10 over the course of the next couple of months, probably higher. The reason that the Russians are doing this civilian obliteration program is because if you have moved most of the population out, then when you do move in with troops, it's just shoot on sight for whatever you see. That's what they did in Grozny. That is what they did in Aleppo. And they will do this for every single population center that they come across. They're also doing it for every small city and town. Now, a couple things come from this. Number one, it means that the would-be 
guerrillas have very few places to hide, and the Russians can just assume that anyone who is still there is hostile. So it removes all the decision-making from the military. Second, if you obliterate the cities and towns, the farmers can't plant or harvest. So you generate a famine at the same time. And from the Russian point of view, the more dislocated, the more starving the population is, the less resistance they can generate. And this is what they're going to do for the entire country. That's already what they're doing for places like Mirapol and Mikolaev and Kiev and Kharkiv. But it's going to be done everywhere. Okay, a number of questions. My first question is, what is the size of the Russian military? In terms of active troops, you're talking give me about active a quarter and, of a million. Give me active and reserves. About a quarter of a million for active. Reserves is going to be closer to 10 million. Remember, this is a country that has a draft. So basically anyone under age 45 could be added to that reserve list if they feel it's necessary. Right, but I mean reserves who have actual training who are- About 10 million. About 10 million because they, yeah. because they actually have mandatory- conscription, but I think some people are have to go to the military in Russia, even if they're not fighting a war. So a lot of the population is Oh, I, I is see what trained. you're talking about. You know, that's going to be closer to a million. Okay. And remember, that is not counting their internal security forces, Got which it. are going to be another couple of million. So the Russian strategy going back to the early czars has been to expand, expand, expand until you hit those gateways. That means they've conquered a lot of people along the way. So the army goes in, gets rid of the regular resistance, and then the interior ministry forces go in and establish an information collection system and basically rule by terror. So once the conventional resistance in Ukraine is pacified, that's when the interior ministry troops will come in, and that's when things get really ugly. That's when you get your pogroms. Okay, so here's where I want to – I have a number of questions. Number one, a lot of people will be listening to this, and they'll say, plug gateways? What do you mean? Who's going to invade Russia? And this is also a confusing point for me as well. While I understand the larger geopolitical argument, what's in the best interest of Russia is not being under massive sanctions when they weren't before and had a, a base of operations in Crimea. It seems to me that their situation is much worse now. And on top of that, the idea that they would be able to pacify, to be even, even be able to successfully invade let alone pacify NATO countries, to me seems asinine. So help me understand the logic that would make sense here. In the American experience, we've had gateway territories as well. Back before we and the Canadians kind of made up, the two big gateways were the Windsor-Detroit connection, you know, the narrow point where the Great Lakes come together, and Lake Champlain, which provided uh, maritime access across the border. And so you could use amphibious landings that go fairly deep into both territories. And so all of the treaties that we had with the Brits when Canada was still a British protectorate dealt with those two zones specifically. They were kind of our, our hot points, our own gateways going north-south. Now, that was obviously fixed before the Civil War, so we haven't had to think about that. A more recent example would be, say, if you remember back to your Cold War history, you remember the Fulda Gap. It was a place in Germany where there was an opening in the Black Forest Mountains, and that is where we were always obsessed about the Russians coming through in mass, and so that was where we stationed a lot of tactical nukes for a worst-case scenario. The Russians have nine of these, and they've always, every time they've been invaded, it's been one through one of the nine. And I realize that in a world of hypersonic missiles, we don't think about this as much, but as we learned in Iraq and as we learned in places like Lebanon and as the Russians have learned in places like Grozny, if you can't secure the land, the rest of it just doesn't matter. Air power is all great and everything, but it doesn't hold territory. And air power by itself is not going to stop an army. Now, is there anyone that looks like they're going to invade Russia now? Of course not. But that's not the point. From the Russian point of view, if they don't do this now, they will not have the demographic strength to resist a future mm -hmm. invasion. And something that has happened in the last three weeks that I've got to admit has got me a little freaked out. Students of history, especially military history, always look to the example of the Nazi rise in 1936 and how from 1936 to 1939, three years, the Germans went from a destitute, depression-riddled Weimar Republic mm -hmm to the Nazi war machine, the capacity of a modern industrialized country, especially the modern industrialized countries that Russia is concerned about, to reinvent themselves overnight is huge. And on the third day of the Ukraine war, 
Chancellor Schultz, who is a pacifist and a socialist, announced that within two years, the Germans were going to double their defense spending. And, you know, that's great for the point of containing Russia. But as a student of history, I had to take a step back there for a second because it felt really familiar and not at all comfortable. Let's hope that Germany's democracy survives this. We can talk about that too. But, you know, historically speaking, the pressures that a place like Germany are under are huge. And when something snaps, it all snaps. So the Russians are looking at the Western periphery here and they realize that this is their last chance. If they don't do it now, it's not going to be done. And it appears that the Germans still have the capacity to reinvent themselves. Or they look south to the southwest and they see a Turkey that is one of the healthiest demographies in the world, one of the largest industrial economies in the world, that is bit by bit extending their influence throughout the broader region. Well, part of that broader region includes Crimea. So from the Russian point of view, history is nowhere near over. We were just on a bit of a pause for a while. Okay, so you took me by surprise there with Germany. I do want to talk about that. I thought you were going to take it to Russia as an analog of interwar Germany with the sanctions causing a breeding source of resentment and a rapid transformation, rapid in relative terms, from a country that, let's say, the population would have been largely against this kind of war to seeing itself as a victim and rising up eventually and causing havoc on the international stage. Well, the Russians definitely see themselves as aggrieved, and they definitely see themselves in the victim role and a bit of a savior complex. The, the ongoing joke in diplomacy cervicals is that the problem with the Russians is they have a superiority complex based on an inferiority complex, uh, as opposed to the Chinese who have a superiority complex based on a superiority complex, but a different topic. It doesn't require any facts for the Russians to feel aggrieved. They have this long history, historical diatribe from their point of view about all the people and all the countries that have done them wrong over the ages. And, you know, in half the cases, at least, they've got a pretty good point. So especially once you constrict any other sources of information, the Russians are going to broadly believe what is on television, especially if they're over age 35, because they've got some memories of what it was like, both in the, if not the Soviet period, certainly the post-Soviet collapse. And there's plenty of angst to play on. I don't think that this war could have ever been averted unless NATO and the EU would have been a very different place and that would have have required different decisions around the end of the Cold War. Uh, We're we're far past that. Okay. So yeah, which brings us back to something we discussed very early on with the end of the peace dividend. I do want to have a conversation about sanctions as well as Germany. Before I do that, though, I want to continue along this conversation about NATO countries. Do you think that the Biden administration believes that Putin's a plan is to also attack NATO countries? Where do you think that, because that's super important here. I just want to highlight that. The views of the administration are very important. So go ahead. When I look at a map, and let's assume for the moment that the Russians conquer all of Ukraine and stop, that doesn't solve their problem. That gives them a large scale occupation, but does not solve any That gives them a new problem that they didn't have before. Yeah, fair enough. New problem. And a big problem, 45 million people that you have to corral and control. But it actually makes their borders less stable because they have even longer borders that are even less secure. So if this is the end of it, this is really stupid. That's why I don't think they're going to stop here. It just just fits the pattern of plugging the gateways one at a time. And I think what you'll see is once Odessa falls... The troops that are in Transnistria, which is this little sliver of a statelet that the Russians have backed since the 90s in eastern Moldova, I think that the troops in Transnistria are going to assist in the attack on Odessa. And once Odessa falls, the Russians will then be able to send regular forces all the way from their border in the east, the far eastern side of Ukraine, through that southern corridor by Mariupol, by Crimea, into Odessa, and then into Moldova. And I think that is going to wake up a lot of people about just how big their ambitions are here. And once that happens, you know, everyone's going to have to redo the math and realize that the Russians really are in this with everything they have. Now, in the White House, I think there's a recognition that that has already happened. And so that's why we're seeing more forces going to Europe. We have a number of troops that have relocated. We have now abrogated every deal that we had with the Russians during the 90s, the 2000s, and the 2010s about not stationing forces in the eastern frontier. And we're seeing Patriot batteries going into places like Latvia and Poland and Hungary and, of course, Romania. So bit by bit, 
and day by day, the Western response is strengthening as it kind of awakens to the scale of what it is the Russians are actually after. But again, we now know that in a direct American-Russian confrontation, the Russians will lose on the conventional battlefield. Which means, if you've got a million or so Russians occupying Ukraine, the remaining tools are nuclear. They will not have the forces necessary to challenge the Western alliance and the Americans in particular, because they're going to be using too many forces to occupy Ukraine. So it is essential that they not leave Ukraine. So we are going to, just so listeners know, we are absolutely going to talk about nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. That's coming up. But I want to actually just nail something down here to make sure I understand perfectly what you're saying. In your view, the peace talks on the side of the Russians are just for show. They have absolutely totally no show. interest whatsoever. Just like all the negotiations that they had with everyone in the two months leading right. up to February I mean, 22. Right, for sure. So let's talk about a few more things before we get to that point. One is the supply chain. So there is a supply chain of weapons that is coming into Ukraine. How long before the Russians are able to plug that, do you think? They would have to control all of Ukraine's borders in order to have, get that. Now, if by get taking out Odessa, which is the primary port, that will really help restrict what the Turks are sending. But if you're talking about the stingers and the javelins, the air defense systems, the, all the anti-tank weapons that are coming in from the Western side, you're talking about having to secure the entirety of the Polish Do border. you expect the Russians to attempt to intimidate Western countries through cyber attacks or, God forbid, WMDs in order to stop the chain of weapons coming into the country before they can actually plug the gap? They have already threatened the nuke card for that reason. Specifically, they've linked those two together. And I think everybody has called their bluff on that because we saw absolutely no increase in preparation of their nuclear forces after Putin gave that order. And Putin, specifically, the Russian leadership in general, has done this from time to time. So all the people that I know who are in the defense space are like, yeah, we take it seriously because it's nukes, but we didn't see any change. So we're watching, but we're really not overly concerned about that at this point. Also, just for context, I want to say that I think it was around the time of the 2016 election that the Obama administration had put out an action alert through the nuclear risk reduction communication system to Russia as a way to also signal the severity with which the administration took election meddling. So this is, this is something that just to give people context, this isn't unprecedented. They didn't necessarily go kind of next level and outright threaten to nuke the United States. Yeah. Also, five months into the Putin administration back in 2000, they shifted the nuclear posture back to a first strike posture. Right. So this is something that has always been on the table. This is always something that's always been part of the discussion process. One of the many reasons why I really would like to keep this all done in Ukraine. There was a second question you had in there that I, I forgot. I think my second question was, will he threaten? Maybe you wanted to take it a little further. I get This was my question. How long before the threats of escalation begin to increase because he cannot control Ukrainian borders? Oh, gotcha. And by the way, I, I just want to throw something else in there too. You can answer this along with it, which is I was expecting to see – cyber attacks or some other form of escalation cyber, right. against the United States and Western countries as a result of the economic warfare against the Russian economy, which is devastating. It is absolutely devastating. There's no doubt that the Russians see this as an act of war. And I've been surprised that we haven't seen a retaliation yet. So combine yes. those two questions into one answer. Sure. So first, the weapons. As long as it is a non-static weapon system, especially if it's man portable, I don't think the Russians are going to do anything. Because there's really nothing that they can do. I mean, you mean if it's, it if it's stuff like stinger missiles or javelins exactly, and stuff like that. Exactly. Because the only thing they can really do is bomb Poland. And then they've crossed the red line. And then all of a sudden, we're talking about having a no fly zone that the Ukrainians have been asking for becoming a lot more aggressive than just a no fly zone. We're talking about the United States, the neutralizing air assets in Russia proper. And the Russians are very certain that that would not be a good thing. So they're just taking it on the chin here. And they're going to take it on a lot chin a lot more over the course of the next month because when this war started, the Ukrainians only had a handful of stingers, only the ones that had been transferred from the Baltic republics. Well, American stingers are now flooding in. And so in the next week or three, we're probably going to see a dramatic uptick 
in the casualty rate for the Russian Air Force because all of a sudden the Ukrainians are going to be armed and able to do it. So this is going to get a lot bloodier on the Russian side as well in the very near future. Now, cyber. Cyber, we were certainly expecting wide-scale cyber attacks, no doubt. Hasn't happened. It appears, and again, this is there's a lot going on behind the curtain, so we're not sure, but it appears that the Russian state has no hacking capacity outside of the bot farm. And as soon as they were limited in their internet access, the bot farm can't do a whole lot. All the hacking, it seems, came from Russian criminal syndicates, and Russia can't command them like they were a state agency because they're crime syndicates. And so we haven't seen an uptick in hacking from those groups. It's entirely possible that some of them are actually sympathizing with the Ukrainians a little bit. But again, this is one of those kind of broad spectrum things where our assessments of Russia just overinflated the threat so far. It's entirely possible that this is part of an incredibly complicated plan where they're trying to lure us into a false sense of security and then just blam us later. I don't know. I think that was their plan, perhaps. But at this point, there's no false sense of security, I don't think. Yeah. Everything that we thought that they could do, they're not doing. So either they're holding it reserved for a later phase of the war, or just our assessments were wrong. And with every extra casualty, every plane that gets shot down, every convoy that gets shot up, every day that the cyber doesn't happen, you got to wonder whether or not those assessments were just completely off. So I'm trying to read between the lines here in how you describe Russia's reticence to attack Poland or some of these other NATO member countries from which the supply of weapons is coming, somehow doesn't square entirely with the thesis in my head about Russia's larger strategic objectives, unless you believe that from a Russian perspective, they're better off bleeding through the occupation of the Ukraine in order to secure all of that territory and move into Moldova, rather than actually bomb NATO member countries to intimidate them to stop sending weapons in and furthering the bleeding that's something as part of a larger conversation around this conflict that I want to continue to Welcome have. Welcome to the strategy of war. Yeah. No, no. And Guessing what the other guy is going to do, hoping that it doesn't do this, try to prevent him from doing that, hoping that they'll do that, try to encourage them to do that. I just want to say we're going to continue this conversation in the second part on the subscriber section of the podcast, Peter. But I agree. I just want to speak to that point, which is that also it may be possible as a result of the fact that maybe the Russian – military security state is somewhat disorganized as a result of leadership issues, we can talk about those, that perhaps they're falling back on their plan, similar to the German general staff in, in World War One, despite the fact that events were maybe giving them alternative information. So it, the need to adjust your plan in midstream may be something that they're having a challenge with. That might be something. I also want to say what we're going to talk about as well in the overtime, besides getting into a conversation about nuclear, which is obviously a huge concern. I think it's a thing that's causing certainly me anxiety and probably most other people anxiety outside of this conflict. I also want to discuss China's role in this situation because I think that's very, very important and interesting or to speculate on it at least. And to the extent that we'll have an opportunity to talk about some of these larger forces that you write about so eloquently in your book, in all of your books, but also in your most recent book that will be coming out in a few months, including energy and food in particular. And also, I should mention the European security picture, how that changes, and the financial system, the dollar system. These are all things that I would like to try to discuss if, to the extent that we can. Busy, busy. Exactly. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener-supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Peter, as well as the episode transcripts and intelligence reports, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Peter, stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation into the premium feed. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, 
check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.